All right. Well, welcome today to the Industry 4.0 podcast or webcast. And I know that this is a newer topic. So if you do have questions, please add them to the chat area and we will get to those questions as soon as possible. Um, I'm going to go ahead while we're waiting on everyone to join and go through the introductions, starting with um, Scott Lang. He is Motion Control Robotics President. Scott has spent over 30 years implementing intelligent manufacturing solutions using his expertise in manufacturing processes, industry controls, and software development. In 1995, he co-founded Motion Controls Robotics. He has successfully grown the robotics company to become the industry leader it is today. Results have included high-performing teams, that have earned industry recognition for their successful and innovative work in the robotic automation industry. And our co-host is Cameron Downs. He is the head of the software development and he is experienced in software engineer, or he is an experienced software engineer with a demonstrated history of working in the logistics and supply chain industry. He's skilled in AutoCAD, electrical wiring, assembly language, electrical engineering, PCL controls, and FANUC robotics. In addition, he has knowledge in full stack web development. Thanks, Nicole. And then our FANUC co-host is James Chikowski, and he is, oh, sorry about that. He is the Senior Engineer, General Industries and Automid Automotive Segment at FANUC. And James is an experienced engineer with a 20 year history of working with industrial automation. He is experienced with machine vision, high speed picking, palletizing, warehousing and process control. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Scott to get started. And he will start by discussing the Industry 4.0 timeline. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, when the term Industry 4.0 uh, has been used significantly recently, and um, so you know, looking into what what does Industry 4.0 mean, and uh, it's really the industrial revolutions that have occurred, uh, you know, over the last uh, 200 plus years. Uh, so the first industrial revolution. Uh, you know, was the use of steam and, and uh, water power. The second industrial revolution that was uh, mass production and electricity. The third revolution, industrial revolution, uh, was using computers and uh, robots uh, in, in automation. And uh, now we find ourselves in the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, with this new era, we're using cloud uh, computing, uh, connectivity throughout the uh, manufacturing uh, floor, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, uh, and these are just some of the uh, many industrial 4.0 technologies. So as far as motion controls goes, we we spent the last 25 years, uh, you know, working in that uh, third industrial revolution, uh, doing lots of automation with, with PLCs and robots, and now we're very excited to participate in the fourth industrial revolution, and um, that's what we want to talk about today. When you talk about industry 4.0, there's multiple phases to it, and uh, certainly we're, we're, there's uh, lots of technologies being invented and are on the cusp today that are out there in the phase four, phase three area, but uh, it's broken up into, into four phases, and the, the, the current one is connectivity uh, throughout the manufacturing facility, uh, capturing lots of uh, good historical data and dashboarding that data. And so motion controls is within the last eight to 10 years has been uh, doing this kind of work uh, out in the field. And then now we're starting to see that phase two where we're starting to look to predict what's going to happen and be able to draw conclusions based on that data that we're capturing and, um, and then displaying that data uh, to, to make good decisions uh, for, the, for the people that are in the, in the manufacturing field. So that's where we are today. Um, you know, soon you'll have uh, computers that can take that data and start to make 
um, uh, predictions on what's going to occur and um, and then get into even phase three where we start to have the uh, you know AI and computers make choices uh, and about those predictions and then finally uh, you know in phase four where uh, eventually uh, you'll have autonomous manufacturing where uh, the computers and, and robots will make decisions for themselves based on uh, inputs of you know vision and sensors and different things like that You go ahead and advance the slide. Thank you. So um, motion again is participating in the early uh, phase two and phase one areas. And I just wanted to talk through some of the, uh, the basic uh, apps that we are working with. So with our impact IQ product, we do tracking and traceability, being able to track products through their life cycle in the manufacturing area, uh, large SKU recipe and order management, uh, dashboarding, of production data uh, on both fixed screens and mobile devices, uh, alarm and event logging, and then interfacing to uh, enterprise area ERPs or warehouse management system systems. And then um, also FANUC uh, ZDT product, which uh, allows us to capture uh, lots of data and, and do predictive analysis on it as well. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Cam uh, for some, some more details on the Internet of Things. Cam? Thanks, Scott. So to, uh, to kick off our Industry 4.0 discussion today, I want to um, define two terms or topics that you'll probably hear a lot of when people mention Industry 4.0. Um, and the first one being Internet of Things. And what this is, it's... Um, they're devices such as like your Amazon Alexa, smart thermostat, smart doorbell, et cetera. And these are devices that are connected to the internet to perform a subset of tasks that make your life easier. And their ability to be smart is this idea of the internet of things. So these devices on their own, they're, they're relatively dumb, so to say. Um, they're not very powerful. But by connecting them to the internet, what you're doing is you're connecting them to very powerful software and very powerful computers to do the work for you um, or to do the work for these devices. Now, the industrial internet of things or IIoT is built on the same concept. Um, these devices are designed to only do a couple things and do them very well. Um, and the industrial internet of things is built to be very reliable and built with security in mind. Um, so on the, on the right, what you'll see is um, two images. And on the left, it's a, um, the left image or thing, since we're talking about Internet of Things, is a, uh, a typical control automation network um, where you have a PLC, you have um, a sensor hub and a bunch of sensors. Um, this is primarily what's used in the industry today. Now the thing on the right is basically the same thing, but now you have it connected to the internet. And with this capability, you're able to do a vast amount of data collection and make real-time use of this data. So if we'll go to the next slide, let's take a look at industry 3.0 architecture. Um, like I said, this is primarily the architecture that's used in industry today. And what you'll see is, as we advance through Industry 4.0, these architectures are going to go away. Um, but there are many limitations with this Industry 3.0 architecture. Number one, it's a rigid architecture, meaning that the PLC is basically the center of your automation. As you can see in this graphic shown on the slide, all of your devices are connected to a PLC or some sort of automation controller, and they're centered around that. Now this works great and it has worked for a long time, but in order for you to scale or um, expand your, your operations, it's, it becomes very difficult. Another drawback is that you have separated operational technology, which is your devices on the floor, your production and in, in your production facility. Um, and you have separated information technology which is your front end office applications, such as um, your enterprise resource planning software, warehouse management systems. These systems don't really play nice together. Um, and if you do wanna get data from 
those front end systems into your production floor, this industry 3.0 architecture makes that very difficult to do so. Um, and lastly, the, uh, the security and remote access becomes very difficult with this architecture as well, because usually when, um, when you need remote access, you need some sort of hub or device to connect to, um, or you have the exact opposite problem where you have very loose security, where you're connecting these devices that aren't secure directly to the internet. So now if we go to the next slide um, and look at industry 4.0 architecture. Um, with this architecture, what we're basically doing is bridging the gap between operational technology and informational technology. For the first time ever, we're actually connecting these two systems together, your front office and your devices on the production floor, and they're able to play nicely together. So the diagram to the right um, shows the same devices like we saw on the previous slide, but they're now no longer centered around a PLC. These devices are, um, they're scalable, they're organized in a horizontal fashion. Um, and they're all centered around what's called an IIoT edge gateway. And I'll explain what this is in depth a little bit later in this presentation. Um, so there's, there's two main, um, two main components of industry 4.0 architecture shown in the slide. There's um, the, the edge gateway. And what that is, it's essentially a computer or server acting as a middleman to connect all your devices together um, through software. And these gateways enable legacy devices to become compatible with IAOT standards and also act as a firewall to allow automation data to be pushed out and allow support for integrators to come in and service these devices. So like I said on the previous slide with Industry 3.0, security and remote access were a big concern and Industry 4.0 architectures solve this problem. Um, and then the second component, oh, go back one second, sorry. Um, and the second component of Industry 4.0 architecture is the actual software. Um, the software that collects the data makes use of all the data that you're pushing out and um, you know, allows you to push it out to a dashboard or exchange information with a material execution system, uh, warehouse management system, or warehouse execution system. So um, for example, I have a, um, you know, a smart video doorbell at home. This, this device is relatively simple, but because of the software that's running in the cloud, it's able to send video of whatever passes by my house outside. And the software in the cloud, very powerful software can determine if it was a car, a dog, human, whatever, and then alert me if someone's at my door. Um, and this is all because of Industry 4.0 and the Internet of Things. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, another pro or another um, um, benefit of Industry 4.0 is that it allows easy scalability. So um, as I showed on Industry 3.0 architecture slide, everything is centered around a PLC. So if you want to scale something, it's going to require a lot of custom coding, um, a lot of changes to make big control systems play nicely together. But when everything is centered around this edge gateway that understands automation, you're easily able to add more systems and use this edge gateway as a central automation hub for devices um, in your plant and even across states to communicate and talk together, and play nicely. So one thing, um, one thing with Industry 4.0 is that it does utilize the cloud. And a lot of times when, whenever you have automation devices and internet in the same sentence, you have a lot of pushback, um, whether it be from your IT team or someone that's just concerned about security, you're gonna have pushback. And you, know, you, might not, you might not be able to connect these devices to the cloud in your organization. Well, you can still benefit immensely from industry, industry 4.0 architecture, um, especially with motion controls impact IQ software 
which I'll talk about later, which actually runs in the cloud or locally, um, whether it be on a, a dedicated device or a virtual machine within your actual organization. Um, so while your devices are completely separated from the internet, you can still have the capability to access historical data and integrate um, with services such as enterprise resource planning software or um, warehouse management systems. Hey Cam, this, uh, this, this is one of those uh, troubled areas where we need to get corporate IT and the, uh, and the manufacturing and the integrators all to be on the same page, making sure we have a secure system, but making sure that we can get access to, to data and uh, so that they can benefit from it. Um, so it's a continued struggle. And, um, but I, th I think in the future, you know, th those teams will get together and, and continue to align everybody's uh, wishes and, uh, and make it happen. Right, and I think, I think one of the biggest reasons why there's so much pushback is because people don't really understand or um, IT doesn't really understand sometimes the benefits that Industry 4.0 can, um, can provide. So um, yeah, that you're gonna see that a lot to where um, that they really need to be educated. And um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of information about Industry 4.0 on how, how it can improve efficiency or create this integrated industry. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I can actually talk about that a little bit more. Um, so with, with Industry 4.0, and having all this data and being able to push it to external services, um, such as like Amazon Web Services or uh, you know Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, to do big data collection and big data analysis, um, it, it provides a lot of benefit because you can actually calculate overall equipment effectiveness in real time and ad adjust production processes in real time. Whereas before, you really couldn't do this because you needed massive amounts of data to do so. Um, so with Industry 4.0, what you have is really in, an integrated industry. Um, you have all these connected assets that are actually talking with each other, pushing data out, and you can essentially create a digital twin of your production floor and create this model to where you can actually predict what's gonna happen based on the data that your devices are pushing out. Um, in addition, this allows you to to have a shorter time to market with new systems because you can actually build these models and it makes testing and design a lot quicker because you have all this data. You know what works, you know what doesn't work before you even start building the system. Um, and then lastly, like I talked about before, with Industry 4.0, you now have that secure remote access diagnostics and support to where you're using this edge gateway, this, this server on your system to to basically be that portal to support your machine if anything goes down um, and even have your data or have your devices push that data up to your integrators so that they can be alerted when, um, when devices start to fail or even before they fail to, to where you can prevent lost downtime. So why, why Industry 4.0? You know, why, why can't we just keep doing what we're doing, um, designing these systems that are very closed loop? Um, why, why is there such a big push? So um, the biggest reason is because of the internet. Um, you know, their data moves around much faster than it used to. Um, and because of this, there's, there's this e-commerce boom to where people have an expectation of, they want things right now. So this widespread of um, internet has caused this e-commerce boom. And because of this e-commerce boom, logistics are a nightmare. Um, you know, there's, there's so much material flow that's going around. The need for data about how your machines are performing and even where the product is throughout your production process is, is greater than ever. So because, um, I'm sorry, in, in addition to the digitalization, Almost every device on our system has made data readily available to collect. So there's all this data to collect and analyze, but it's basically stuck inside your system if you're using old um, architectures and old technologies that we've been using in this industry 3.0 era. So 
with Industry 4.0, um, you know, we have the capability. We have um, we have these cloud services, and they're reliable now, and they're relatively new. And data collection is now cheaper than ever. You know, before to set up the data collection, to set up the efforts that we need to to make data analysis a reality, it was you know it was a nightmare. So now because of cloud services, this is easily able um, to be done. But they're um, on the next slide, yep. So there are some, um, there are some problems. With any new technology, there's gonna be problems. Um, but with Industry 4.0, a couple of problems that I wanted to point out is that you're, what you're gonna see is an abundance of single use and standalone applications. Um, and what I mean by this is that you're gonna have all of these, um, all of these device manufacturers that, that wanna get in the Industry 4.0 game, um, they're gonna start developing these industrial internet of things. And it might, it might be you know, a smart photo eye or a smart analog sensor, and they might have a dashboard attached to them. And these are great. They can actually solve a lot of problems on small systems. But if you want to, you know, if you really wanna track and see what's going on, these devices really aren't going to tell you much. Um, you know, a, a tracking air usage um, on a system is great. It tells you if you know if you're having an air leak somewhere, but it doesn't tell you a picture about what caused the air leak to fail. You know, the bigger picture. Um, you you couldn't track if, how how well your um, system's performing just based on these standalone applications. What you need is, you know, custom software. Um, you need a fully integrated system. Um, and then another problem you're going to see is a data overload. You know, with all of this capability to collect all this data, um, you need to be able to make use of it. Um, there's a quote I like that um, that I think it applies to this data overload scenario. Um, it goes. If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. And uh, really, what this means is, you know, Industry 4.0 takes planning. Um, if you don't plan out what data is important, um, you have to take the time to plan this out. And if you don't, you're just going to have all this data, and you're not going to even know what to do with it. Um, so, over this um, over this presentation, we're going to cover. Uh, a wide variety of 4.0 applications. And uh, the first one I wanna cover that is a really a really good example of a fully integrated um, industry 4.0 application is FANUC ZDT. Um, what FANUC ZDT is, it's, or FANUC Zero Downtime, it, uh, it monitors the health and uh, robot data to, to produce actionable insights from this data. Um, and our guest speaker, James, would love to tell you more about this. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. All right, so let's continue to look at uh, how FANUC has uh, approached Factory 4.0 with uh, this product, uh, uh, Zero Downtime. It's actually a combination of a product and a service. So we'll, we'll get into some of the details about how it works, and then we'll take a, a closer look at how it fits into Factory 4.0. It, um, as a product and a service, it's been implemented on a global scale with customers finding great value in a variety of industries and applications all over the world. Next, Nicole. So we encounter many frameworks or models for approaching uh, factory 4.0 implementation, but these two are fairly common in what we, uh, what's brought to us. Uh, the ISA 95 automation pyramid on the left, uh, this assigns uh, information to a hierarchy of complexity. So it breaks down each level into time frames. On the left side, you can see there's uh, milliseconds going up to seconds, minutes, hours, and days. And on the right side, it links that to uh, technology. So sensors, PLC, SCADA, MES, and ERP on the right side. Um, in general, if you want a simplified way of looking at this, you have data at the bottom, and uh, it grows up into, becomes information as it works its way upward. And as you're probably aware, not all data grows up to become information. That's kind of what Cameron was talking about there. Uh, and understanding the difference is, is kind of the, one of the subtleties here 
and uh, that's that's something that uh, that you you have to pay attention to and be aware of. Um, ZDT basically fits on this pyramid by collecting data on the uh, robots exist on level one, but they have devices connected on level zero. So it monitors level one and level zero and passes information and data upwards into level two and three. And if you're uh, clever with it, you can utilize the data to generate information on level four. Um, the other framework we see is overall equipment effectiveness. Um, and what this is basically a way, a way to break down uh, time allocated to production and maintenance. So at the top, we have everything 24 seven, every hour of every day, that's total available time. We remove a portion of this time at each step down the chain. So starting with everything and removing scheduled downtime leaves us with a planned production time. Uh, that time is allocated for planned production. The time that's allocated for planned production that doesn't end up being operating time uh, is called availability loss. Um, and if our operation is not fully optimized, some of the operating time will be lost to performance in inefficiencies. That's the next step down. Uh, this includes bottlenecks, uh, system priming, and uh, runout times. Um, so it's another uh, place that 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 uh, ultimately your your good products are lost. And uh, finally, parts that are made or created but don't meet quality standards. Uh, that's tracked in the uh, the last red box, which is quality loss. Um, OE is usually calculated as uh, stage percentages, which are the uh, the green boxes here as um, 100% at the top and then uh, percentage at each stage down. So all the good things happen in the green boxes. So of course we have to focus on the red boxes with this. Um, and we'll take a, a closer look at how ZDT fits into this calculation after we take a tour of what ZDT is. Um, here's a quick overview of how it's connected. You can see a typical production facility at the bottom with all types of machinery and automation running. Um, the robots uh, use several networks for communicating at the device and cell levels, but the, the network we see here is called the plant network, which connects all the robots uh, in the, the facility together on a, a globalized network. Um, this is used for backups and low traffic data. It's usually production status and uh, maybe monitoring small programs if you're, you're keeping an eye on something uh, from your desk. It's fairly standard network topology. This has been uh, kind of the industry standard for a couple of decades now. Uh, ZDT adds a data collector onto a server on this plant network. And it collects data that's sent by the robots and it relays it to our cloud in, on an encrypted external network. So the robots are never actually exposed to uh, the external network. In the cloud, um, various analytics, uh, so this is on the left side here, various analytics are performed. Uh, the results of these analytics can be viewed either through a portal, which is uh, basically a secure web page that the user can log into from their desk, um, or it'll generate reports and emails. Um, if an analytic detects a potential concern, ZDT will generate an alert, and that will result in an email that's sent to the user and the uh, FANUC support team, which is the uh, person in the yellow bubble at the top. And uh, that will initiate a conversation with the facility that says there's a potential concern. Um, do we need, uh, the action items will dif uh, differ, differ based on what the, um, the alert is. So it could be collecting a sample or um, observing something or changing a battery depending on, uh, on the, the specifics of the alert. Um, but at this point, FANUX support team is, is involved and uh, this helps coordinate things like uh, sending uh, replacement parts or um, getting uh, um, advice from uh, our database of uh, ob observed um, history. So let's take a look at a few analytics and how the information is presented. We'll, we'll specifically look at the portal. So we'll start with the predictive maintenance um, category. Um, this is uh, related to both the uh, system and the mechanical health of the robot. Uh, there's a couple, several analytics, but here's a couple of key ones. Uh, drive health analytic monitors the overall um, health of every drive on every robot and it uses several different strategies. So this will include motors, reducers, gearboxes, and all the various types of uh, drive components. 
Um, reducer health is a separate analytic. It, it monitors specifically reducers and it uses a slightly different strategy. Um, both of these are able to identify uh, failing components up to three weeks before failure, depending on the, uh, the type of failure. Um, the excessive e-stop analytic tracks alarms uh, along with access speeds and uh, access torques with every servo off event. So every time the robot's moving and it uh, stops because of an alarm, it's tracked in this, uh, this uh, analytic here. And uh, along with the uh, timestamp, the date and uh, the name of the program running, the line number and uh, the speeds of everything that we're moving. Uh, also in this category, uh, we have a uh, control and memory in several battery levels that are monitored and reported so that they can be replaced before finding out the hard way that uh, your batteries were low. So anybody that's worked in uh, maintenance might know the headaches in uh, restoring production after a power outage. So ZDT will help keep your robots ready to go because usually you find out about all your dead batteries when, when you have a power outage. It's not a, not a fun thing. Um, okay, you can go next. Um, the intention uh, for predictive maintenance is that um, worn components can be repaired or replaced during scheduled downtime rather than waiting for them to fail during uh, planned operation. Um, so here's a quick look at the um, portal. Uh, you'll start with the list of robots at this location. Uh, the top in this list, we can see the top robot is reporting an issue with mechanical health. Health, so that's the red X, we'll click on that. And that takes us to a summary page for this robot's mechanical health. And in this case, we can see that the reducer health analytic has, uh, is reporting an issue. So we take a, click on that and take a look at what this is reporting. Uh, this is the, the front page of the uh, reducer health and it actually has the issue listed at uh, near the top. Um, it gives us some uh, recommended actions to help address this specific issue. And in this case, I don't know if you can read it, but it says they want to collect the grease sample and sit to panic for analysis. And in the grease sample, uh, we will be able to monitor the, uh, the, the uh, contents of the grease and tell whether or not, uh, what type of failure is going on or if, um, if there's a need to address it or if it's a, a grease issue. Um, so if we want to take a closer look at the data, we can actually click on, uh, the, scroll down the page and um, this shows us the summary of the analytic in uh, bar graph form. So you see the result for joint two started to ramp up around the blue arrow. Uh, so each, each one of these bars is, uh, is recorded every day. So in, in this example, they actually found that the grease itself was the cause of the issue. Um, so they were able to identify it quickly and um, schedule maintenance for later in the week because they determined that uh, this wasn't going to damage anything over the, uh, the, the couple of days. So they scheduled maintenance for the weekend and uh, at the orange arrow, and once the grease was replaced, they returned to production and uh, the analytics returned to normal on the, uh, the green arrow. So that's an example of uh, a mechanical analytic. Um, program changes are often made with good intentions, but they can, uh, there can be hidden effects that impact production rates or process quality. So the big challenge with this is that it can happen without awareness and can be hard to track down what parameters were changed, uh, especially overnight. So the ZDT process change analytic uh, includes a data view that shows all the changes uh, to robot programs and a specific set of system variables that you can define yourself. Um, for each day, any changes are logged. A line item for process change is added to the uh, email notification. And uh, along with that, there's a link to the data view. So you see that on the, uh, the, the mini screen here um, in, in this slide here. Uh, you have a timestamp for each process change that was made in the robot. This includes uh, the changes made to the, um, the, the teach pendant program that was listed. And uh, on the bottom line, I don't know if you can read it, but I believe it says at 3.44 p.m., um, style eight had a Z value change and it has the uh, before and after values. Um, you can also track system variable changes that, uh, that you define. So yeah, I, I think this, this is a, a crucial one as opposed to like analyzing large amounts of data, but being able to come back to a date and time and, and be able to see what occurred. Uh, it's, it's a crucial piece to, to capture. I know we've had a couple of instances where 
we've uh, we've run into trouble like that, and then having to get back in there and find out you know, what was changed, when it was changed, and uh, to get things back running again. So yeah, crucial yeah. benefit. Absolutely, and it's it's kind of like a, a breadcrumb trail of um, you don't know exactly what you're looking for until you need to look for it, and this is kind of keeps track of everything there. Um, okay, can we advance? I think yeah, actually I yeah. There we go, operational insights. Um, it's not always easy to see how effectively each robot in an operation is uh, being utilized without conducting uh, specific studies or adding program timers into the PLC uh, controller, line controller. Um, it's another one of those situations that you don't necessarily know what you're looking for until you see it. So ZDT uh, is able to provide a, uh, an overview of uh, operational insights through a couple analytics, uh, a couple key ones here. Uh, cycle status tracks the data for each job or cycle that is performed and you define what a job or a cycle is. It's typically um, in the neighborhood of uh, 30 seconds or uh, up to a couple minutes, but that's up to you. Um, so the cycle status will record the complete cycle time, the power consumption, and um, any set of variables that you want to collect. So it could be IO states, uh, timers. Um, if you have several timers, that's probably, you know, starvation time, that sort of thing. You can collect that with each job as well. Uh, the operating time analytic, and this is the one that's showing up in the, the middle uh, mini screen here. Um, this collects more generalized data that tracks the amount of time each robot is running versus idle uh, versus faulted for each 24 hours in uh, each given day. Um, the blue is idle time, green is time spent in operation, and red time is faulted. So this snapshot uh, is a nice visualization of uh, the way the robot spent its time. Um, and in this case, uh, this particular robot was pretty idle before about 8 a.m. And uh, I think it might be, um, I might be able to relate with this robot, so. Um, to navigate to these analytics, this is just the, uh, the screen that the, the portal would take you to. Uh, we get to the system information screen. Um, this is where you could also configure your own uh, alarms with your own thresholds or review the alarm lock details. But the two that we just talked about are uh, circled in blue here, the cycle status and the robot operating time detail. Next, okay. Um, ZDT keeps track of your maintenance tasks for each robot and lets you know in advance when maintenance is uh, approaching or coming due. Um, this is not this not only helps extend the life of the robot, but it allows you to make better use of your resources when you're planning maintenance tax, tasks. So on the mini screen here, we have a summary of the scheduled maintenance tasks for this particular robot. Um, the status bar will change color from uh, yellow to orange as the task deadline approaches. and uh, if, if you ignore the task, it becomes red and it uh, kind of scolds you in that way. Um, once the maintenance task is completed, you can uh, reset it on the screen also. Uh, this is a valuable tool for customers with many robots. Uh, it helps you track all of your assets, but it's also a valuable tool, tool for um, customers with only a couple of robots if they don't have uh, dedicated robot technicians maintaining uh, their robots. So this will let them know when it's time to call someone in and help them uh, maintain their equipment and keep it healthy. So let's return back to the um, OE overall equipment effectiveness graphic and uh, look at how ZDT fits into this calculation. At the first step, uh, the size of planned production box doesn't actually change. It's, it's uh, scheduled, right? So um, the strategy here is to make the best use of the uh, scheduled downtime. That's where the, uh, the maintenance schedule helps optimize resources uh, for schedule maintenance. And so help keep your robots at optimal health so that they're ready to go when, uh, when you need them for planned production. You also track the uh, performance-based, um, there's a couple of performance-based um, analytics here too. So your EOAT timing, your, your gripper timing will help track uh, air pressure loss, vision timing if your camera's going out of focus. Uh, controller memory is another one that uh, that you'd want to address in your schedule downtime. Next, uh, addressing availability loss is a little bit more challenging, but it's it's probably it's definitely more important because uh, your operating time is when you're fully staffed, right? Which is uh, 
you're spending a lot of money to keep your uh, production running here. So availability loss is unscheduled downtime. Um, the general strategy here is to minimize, minimize the amount of availability loss. So the, uh, the width of the red box here. Um, predictive and performance-based maintenance analytics help move downtime out of this availability, availability loss box into the scheduled downtime box. Um, also, operational insights help identify repeating short duration interruptions. So if you have a, um, a, a flickering uh, fence circuit, uh, you'll be able, you'll get notification on it if it flickers within, if you set the threshold up to let's say 50 times in a day, it'll, it'll uh, notify you with an email if that, uh, that's happening and uh, you can get that addressed in your scheduled downtime. Um, if the system does experience unscheduled downtime, ZDT also has tools that'll help minimize the duration. And we, we looked at some of those little process change and um, some of the alarm log details. So strategy there, minimize unscheduled downtime. Now the last two boxes, uh, performance loss and quality loss are very specific for every application. So we need a broader set of tools to monitor and analyze these aspects of overall equipment effectiveness. So I'm gonna return back to Cameron and he's gonna demonstrate uh, Impact IQ that Motion Controls has developed to help um, address these, uh, these boxes. Thanks, James. So yeah, like uh, like Scott mentioned um, earlier, we have our own, um, Motion Controls has our own industry 4.0 based application um, called Impact IQ. Um, and it's, it's, we took a modular approach on it um, to, to help solve a, a various subset of um, problems or, or needs that we've seen in the industry. Um, and the first one that I'd like to talk about is our, our tracking and traceability module. Um, so when you have a large automation system with a lot of product flow, um, it's, it's often very difficult to track production. You oftentimes have, have to have people on the floor physically watching the machine run, um, or even several people. And even then you have to trust that the data that they're recording is accurate. So with the tracking and traceability module with Impact IQ, what we're able to do is we're able to basically have a snapshot of where the system was and what happened, or where a product was in the system and what happened to that product throughout various points in the system. So what we'll do on a project that uses tracking and traceability, we'll install either barcode readers or um, RFID readers through, throughout the system at strategic points where you might wanna track something. Um, so some things that you might wanna track is um, you know, the weight of the product. Um, maybe it has to pass a certain weight. Um, another, another thing that you might wanna track is where it was, location, or even what pallet it was placed on. Um, in this example, we're using labels placed on, uh, placed on the product, scanning them. And um, these labels have, or this, this barcode scanner has two purposes at this point. Um, one is to you know track and trace where the where the product is, but another is actually to look up information about that product based on the barcode and actually tell the robot where to put that product in the system. And this is through our um, our uh, recipe and order management module, which I'll cover next. So, like you saw, what the what the system was doing, it was scanning those barcodes and the software running all this was taking that barcode, looking it up in the database, seeing what product it was, looking up all the information associated with that product and sending it back to our automation system. So the, um, the barcode might have details such as the, the item number, the description of it, the size, the weight, the color, et cetera, about this, um, about this product. In addition, what you can do with the order recipe management and um, tracking and traceability is order management through, um, you know, I, through the number of items to run, um, you know, SKUs to run, start and, top, start and stop time, et cetera. Um, in the past, what I've seen is you'll actually have a person that's, um, you know, going off an enterprise resource system. They're looking up an order. 
writing it down, going over to a machine, entering, here's how many cases I have to run. This is the product I'm running. With software taking that person's place, you, you have 100% accuracy and you basically have robotic process automation to where you can basically run a machine 24 seven with software, start and stop it, track when an order was started, when it was completed, how many items you ran without ever needing any, any human interaction um, to bridge that gap between IT and OT like mentioned earlier. Um, another module that, um, that I'd like to show is our ERP um, or WMS integration like I mentioned on the slide before. So what we're able to do is we're able to connect to various systems, um, IT or front office systems and send that data directly to the production floor. Whereas in the past, this was really hard to do. Um, and with, with Industry 4.0, this, this makes it even easier because I've seen a lot of customers or projects to where you might have your, your headquarters based in one state, but your production facility based in another state. So with Industry 4.0, the ability to exchange data, put it on, uh, put it on a gateway, um, have your ERP system connect to the cloud, have your gateway talk to that cloud and exchange all this data, it makes it really easy to do. And especially um, if you have you know, 10 production facilities or production facilities around the world, this is, um, it's a huge benefit to have an architecture like this and to have software like this because um, there, you know, with any data exchange, there's, there's, um, there's room for error. But when you have software involved, that error goes way down. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, this is probably one of the coolest modules that we have. It's uh, the dashboarding module. And it really, it really um, proves out why Industry 4.0 can be useful um, by making use of mass amounts of data collection. So like mentioned on the previous slide, um, you might have someone that just sits there and watches a machine. Um, but I can guarantee you they weren't writing down every single time a case was picked or every single time a case was placed, um, you know, when an e-stop was pressed, when the e-stop was reset, when a robot cell was entered, um, you know, the list could go on and on. Um, by using software, we're able to collect hundreds of thousands of data points, aggregate them and put them into an easy to read dashboard um, to calculate overall equipment effectiveness induction rates, uh, we can show downtime over the day, and all in an easy to understand graph to whereas before, without all this data collection and that, uh, data aggregation and analysis, it took either a process, a process engineer or a data scientist to really understand what was going on with the system um, without the use of a dashboard. So with the use of a dashboard and the use of charts, basically anyone can look at this and say, okay, my machine ran really well today, or it didn't, it ran really poorly, um, strictly by looking at, you know, how, how well your machine performed based on overall equipment effectiveness or end up counts, um, or looking at your aggregate of alarms over the day or how much downtime you had. This is all capable through our dashboarding module. Yeah, Cam, um, just, uh, just not to interrupt, but uh, one of my, one of the things I'm most excited about is the, opportunity, we're able to change the date and times of the dashboards to bring in more data or less data. So the opportunity to take all the alarms, you know, currently you, you kind of look at what, what was the last alarm that we dealt with, you fix it and you move on. But if you can look at it over a week or a month or a year, and all of a sudden you've, you pull in all that data and find out that there is a nuisance alarm that keeps occurring and, uh, and no one really thought about it. It happens once a week, but it's causing a, a a lot of downtime. Now you can address something on a larger scale. Um, so I, I think this is going to be super valuable in that area. Um, you can also do this with our um, uh, the dashboarding to show events such as starvation or um, you know bottlenecks that you weren't aware of because they're so small. But when you look at a large amount of data over a long period of time, all of a sudden those those issues percolate to the top. So uh, this is a, this is a product that I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, and it's definitely got that cool factor too, like uh, Cam mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, and a perfect example I like to use 
is um, you know, a light curtain example. So imagine you have a 40 inch light curtain and you're placing products on a pallet and they have to go through a light curtain. Well, through this dashboarding module, you're able to track any faults that might occur. So let's say you're putting products that stack up to 41 inches on that, on that pallet and it only happens during, let's say second shift. Well, now you actually are able to capture that data, look up what products or look up what time that, that faulted and by that data, look up, um, look up what products were on that pallet. And you might notice, oh, there's 41 inches of product running through a 40 inch light curtain. Then you can easily change your production flow to no longer, no longer trigger that, trigger that fault. Um, so with this, we can go into a, uh, a demo on our, our software actually running. So um, it's one thing to you know, talk about is talk about the, uh, the capabilities, but I think it's another thing to show it. So um, in this example here, what we have is a, uh, an internal runoff at motion controls on one of our, uh, um, our systems that we were testing. Um, it's a, sim a simple single palletizer robot cell. Um, and as you can see, right away, there's an active alarm showing that the robot is starved. Um, this is pretty, a pretty common fault that we'll have in, in the robotics industry to where it's not really, you know, it's not a bad fault. It's just saying, hey, the robot's sitting there waiting for product doing nothing. Um, and it's, it's being not utilized. So as we start picking and placing, what you'll see is the live data start coming in. Um, and this is done through data collection through a various of sen uh, through uh, a set of sensors on the robot and on the conveyor. And through this, what we're able to see is um, data coming in, we're able to see the pick and place counts, what time the pick and place occurred, um, and just very easily see how well the system is performing. So you'll see that the gate was opened. Um, they, the operator had to go in and fix an error. Um, so the machine was stopped in order to be in a safe state. And you can see how long that gate was open for. Now, right off the bat, since that gate was open, the availability on our overall equipment effect, uh, effectiveness module, it went way down just because we were opening that gate for a short amount of runtime. Now, as the system progresses and as the layers progress, you'll see that the system starts running um, a lot better and our OEE goes way up. So our availability is going up, our performance is going way up, um, which is a calculation of your ideal cycle time times the total pieces that you have ran divided by your operating time. So it's looking like right now we're at about 80% effectiveness. Um, now I think this machine didn't run at rate, so I don't think we'll ever get to 100%, um, but with this OE module, you're able to easily see how well your machine's running just by a quick glance. To as before, you might be getting products out of your cell all day and not realize that you were only ever running at 80%. So um, it's a really cool tool to be able to use and to have. Yeah, again, Cam, I, I love the, um, the fact that we've aggregated, you know, how many times the robot was starved for a total duration, how, you know, how often the gate was opened, and uh, that can answer a lot of questions for a, uh, for a customer when they're, they're trying to diagnose what's going on with the cell and maybe why they're not getting quite the, the amount of production out the door they'd like. Right. And with this, um, with this tracking as well, what we're able to do is we're able to send out alerts based on you know, how, how long the cell was starved. You, know, you can set up alerts to say, hey, the cell was starved for five minutes. I need to send out a text. I need to send out an email to let someone know because while we have this software running on our cell, a lot of times with big integrations or large production facilities, we might have other integrators equipment feeding our equipment. And we might not know that the line's down or why the line's down. So by sending out this, by sending out these alerts, it'll alert an operator or maintenance personnel to go look at the system and they might find out, hey, the machine that's feeding the cell is actually causing the problem. It's not actually this cell itself. So um, one thing you'll notice is for this demo, the quality was at 100%. And that's because um, for this project, we didn't have rejects because we were expected good product. 
Um, so we weren't tracking any quality issues, um, but to track quality, it's simply a, the, uh, the percentage of good or the, the good count over the total count of your items in the system. So like I said, for this cell, we weren't tracking, um, we weren't tracking quality issues. So if we go to the next slide, um, another important aspect of our whole Impact IQ platform is the alarm and event logging. So in the, uh, in the demo on the previous slide, you'll notice that there were a couple times where the robot stopped, but there wasn't an alarm. And this can be caused due to teach pendant, um, you know, enabling the teach pendant or pausing the system to where, yeah, there's no alarm, but it was caused by operator intervention. Um, so an operator caused this downtime. So with this alarm and event logging, we're actually able to go back in time, see when our production was low or when we had stopped times or when we had lost times and actually find out the root cause of that. Um, in addition, like kind of what was shown during James's presentation about operator changes or parameter changes, we're actually, we're actually able to do the same thing and track um, HMI logins or parameter changes through the HMI, recipe changes, you know, something that might cause the system to not perform as expected because a human was involved. We're actually able to go back and look at that. Um, next slide. So here's an example of how um, your quality could be tracked. So you'll see a outfeed conveyor and a rework bin. Um, with tracking quality, what you're able to do is track every time something was placed into the rework bin. And with our tracking and traceability module, you're able to see what time it was, uh, what time it was placed in there. You can track the image of the vision verification that made it fail and also what product. So then you could go back and throw on a dashboard, a chart of how many failures you had for that part. So it's really powerful analytics that you're able to, uh, to gather and aggregate from these modules. Uh, next slide. Um, in addition, you can track system health. Um, some things that we've done in the past is monitor uh, you know, compressed air, um, current, uh, track reoccurring alarms. Um, you know, you might have a system that is always running the same amount of products every day. So you would expect that it would use the same amount of air every day. Um, with this monitoring, what we can do is actually detect trend anomalies. So like I said, you're running the same amount of product every day. And then one week you have an enormous spike in air usage. Well, that probably indicates an air leak and we can actually alert this and show it on a dashboard um, and show it in a report that, hey, your system's using way more air than we think it should or what it has used in the past for the same amount of production run. So um, a good example of this is actually a project that we, uh, we just implemented. Um, we have pretty much all of our software modules in use at the, on this project to where we're doing tracking and traceability, um, order management. We have a, uh, uh, the customer has an ERP or resource planning system that they will plan orders. And basically there's, there's no one involved in this entire system to enter the orders um, we have smart carts going around to, to pick up and deliver product. And you're able to track the location of each product. We have barcodes on each case. We're scanning them, um, tracking the location, um, letting the, the PLC and robot know what pallet to place them on. And in addition, we can actually track um, the layer count, layer time, and um, items that are actually on a pallet. So uh, the customer had a huge requirement for um, tracking later on because they'll have quality issues and they wanna be able to track everything by a lot number. So we can actually go back, they can give us a lot number and we can tell them, okay, you had this, these cases were on this pallet and it's limited to this lot number. So you're able to narrow down your issues and narrow down your bad product to basically down to the case. Um, so here's another example of our app tracking um, 
active faults. Um, this was a very large system. So it was perfect to be able to aggregate. I think we had 28 PLCs on the system. We're able to aggregate all of that data into one central location. And um, um, you know, you can view the, the trending of alarms uh, and view the area overview from a very easy to use web application. Um, if you go to the next slide, here's an example of the tracking that we used on this system. So we had um, each, each case had an LPN or license plate number assigned to it. And from this, what we were tracking is um, the, the tape detection on a case. We had a, a tape uh, or a case sealer and we could track every single time a, uh, a tape, tape inspection failed, um, every single time a carton label didn't apply correctly. Um, and we could even track, I think we were even tracking, um, you know, the lot number and um, where, where it was throughout the system. So there's a lot of information that you can do through the tracking and traceability uh, module. Um, next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, I think I think our host had to run off for a second. Um, but as I was saying, there's some, um, you know, this app is very powerful. Um, in addition, what we could do was um, we had we had alarm and event logging on the system as well. So so what we were able to do is track every single event that occurred at all the points throughout the system. The system was way too large for operators to just watch. So as you can see here, we have alarms for our Dunnage shell, our, our pallet wrappers. Um, like I said, we have light curtain faults to where someone hit or someone triggered the light curtain and everything is timestamped down to the, the second. And you can even track the duration of that fault and when it was acknowledged. So there's a lot of powerful data um, that you're able to look at. And you can easily export it to third-party applications for to do your own data mining or data processing if you if you prefer. Um, and this is just one more screen to show our order tracking and order management that we were that we were doing through our order management module. Um, we had order codes, lot number um, that were supplied from the customer, and we are able to track when the order was started, when it was finished, and it was all done automatically through our automation system. Um, so here you can see that we had four orders in progress and um, you're able to track all the completed orders and actually see a history of all orders that ran through the system um, in the past. So I think that's all I have and I will open it up for questions. Uh, Nicole, you're muted. Sorry about that. Anyway, can you can you hear me now that I'm not muted? My uh, headphones died on me. Can you hear me? Yep, we can okay, hear you. Good. All right, so during this, we had a question from uh, Larry that he wanted to have you guys address a little bit from your experience, um, the difficulty in bridging the gap between IT personnel and their production counterparts. Like what approaches have you used to solve that problem? And I know, especially uh, Fanic, I know you've worked with a lot of large, or Fanic's worked with a lot of large companies and, and convinced them to you know, use some kind of data collection. So they are just kind of curious about um, how you got them to agree. Well, I think if you look at ZDT, I think you'll see that a lot of the design is kind of, in, in anticipation of some of the questions that they're going to see. And I would say probably to the point where there was a lot of anticipation and a lot of work put into addressing things before they came up. And uh, the other thing is making sure that everything is documented and, and obviously um, professional and, and considered and just um, when you present them with, with a, uh, a document, uh, 
that, that just says all your ducks are in a row. It makes it a lot easier to, uh, to get through those conversations. And quite often it, that's what they want to see is that you're not, uh, you know, that you are taking their, their needs seriously and addressing their concerns. Uh, and so being able to show them that you've, you've already considered it before you get into the conversation definitely helps. I would also say that during uh, getting them involved early in the concepting phase, so when you sit down with the customer and we're talking about how the system's going to operate with plan engineers and with the, with the purchasing uh, people, that you also get IT involved at that point so they can see the expectations that, uh, that they want as a corporation right. and, and how we're handling it. So making sure those expectations are set up front and then it makes it much easier for them to swallow. If you come in at the... Yeah. The ninth hour when you're, you're you're installing the system and you're asking for all kinds of access to their networks that that uh, is a little bit yeah. more panic on there and at that point yeah and absolutely the other thing i'll say is that if um you know if the the right people really want your product then then it'll get through the uh, the hurdles to get there so making sure that you're you have the support of the uh, uh of the people that really make the decisions definitely helps Right. Yeah, I think the willingness to work with the customer is the, the major driving factor. Um, I'll give a perfect example of a recent project that we did. You know, we came to them with our, our spec, our software spec, and our, our hardware spec to where we told them we, we would we usually like to put our industrial hardened PC that is a backplane PC. It, it sits in the, the cabinet on the floor. All we need to do is just connect to your network. It's secure, our software is built around security, but their IT team came back and they said, absolutely not. You cannot have your own PC. If there's a PC, we need to own it. We need to manage it. Yeah. Um, so they said, can your software run on our virtual machine? We came back and said, absolutely. Um, and I think integrators and um, providers just need to be open to being flexible to you know, make, make the customer feel comfortable about your software running in their environment. Um, right. you know, where they have lots of sensitive data and sensitive production information that cannot get out. Right. And uh, the design of, of ZDT is that uh, the robots are never connected to the, uh, the internet. And that's, that's partly because they all create Facebook accounts when, when you let them. So, uh, but I'll, no, seriously though, from a security standpoint, you'll, you'll often hear, we just don't allow robots to connect to the internet. And we can say quickly, yeah, we don't, we don't want you to do that either. So, yeah, just addressing things before they come up definitely helps. Nicole, you're muted. Does anybody have any further questions um, about this topic on um, getting IT to agree to connecting, or if you have other questions about the presentation. All right, um, one other question that we had was um, whether you're able to implement this um, kind of data collection in a system that is an older system. So like if you have like a 10 year old system, could you take what we are offering and implement that? I can take this. Um, yeah, actually, we've been, um, well, we haven't been doing the mass amounts of data collection that we're doing currently on our projects. We've been doing, um, you know, this some some interconnectivity between our, our ERP systems and databases with PLCs for about 10 years now. Um, so as long as you have some sort of PLC with, uh, with an Ethernet interface um, and uh, our software running at your site, we're able to speak some of the languages um, and messaging protocols, even on older PLCs where, you know, they might not be tag based, but they have messaging capabilities. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it just really takes some, um, it really takes communication from the customer to, you know, determine what kind of, what kind of um, equipment they have and what we can do with it. And even if you don't have any equipment that's capable of this, you can add on these IIoT devices to where it might not be a fully integrated system, but
but it can at least get you started with some data collection. Um, I think on the first slide, those orange things, um, which were uh, the sensor hubs that were internet enabled, those, um, you know, it's not a complete solution, but those are able to put, put additional sensors or um, put a data collection point on your system to where you can start counting case induct counts or outfeed conveyor counts, start doing some basic data collection to just get you started and actually see the benefit. And um, even with just a few data collection points, you'll see um, that the results are, are pretty phenomenal. Um, even in our demo, we had about five data collection points to where you could see all of that data flowing through and actually create that dashboard just from a couple of data points. Yep. It's more of a strategy than the technology, I would think, right? Right. And uh, specifically for ZDT, I'll just address this. There, it does go, it is uh, compatible with, with a few generations back, uh, but you should contact us with your specific uh, software versions if uh, you want me to look at uh, compatibility through, um, through older controller models. Might require a software update. All right, great. Thank you guys for answering those questions. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you do have further questions, you can contact any of the hosts at the email addresses. This um, presentation will also be available um, on demand on our website. And if you attended today, you will get a link to that. So you can go in there, watch it, grab screenshots or get more information from the on-demand version. And we're skipping next month with our webinar with our webinars, but back in, in back in August, we will be doing a robotics roundtable, and that's a chance for everyone to speak. So you guys will be panelists if you join us, and we'll all have a discussion about robotics, what is going on, what you just might be curious about, or any questions that you bring. We will have engineers and programmers here to answer those questions. And we'll also have a representative from Phoenix about, uh, that can answer questions about robots. All right. Perfect. Again, thanks everybody for attending and thank you guys, the host, for bringing the Industry 4.0 to light today. Yeah, thank you for joining so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed that.